after the wedding, little ring bearer asked his father, how many brides can the groom marry? One, his father said, why do you ask? Because the minister said he could marry 16. The boy said, puzzled. How do you come up with that, his father asked. Easy, the little boy said. All I have to do is add it up like the minister said, four better, four worse, four richer, four poorer. All together, that's 16. <laughs> Kids say some strange things and think some strange things, don't they? Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we pray that you will add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of your word. We pray that you will direct this word right into the hearts where you want it to go and that it'll cause the effect that you want it to have, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter nine, I'm gonna read nine verses, 10 to 19. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Paul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Of course, Saul, as we know him as Paul, the Apostle Paul, who really, really started so many churches and wrote a whole lot of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the letters in the Bible and did suffer a whole lot for the gospel, but he was on his way to Damascus with letters from the officials in the temple in Jerusalem to arrest people who had become Christians and bring them back in chains. And um, he was trying to destroy the church. And instead, this is what happened. And he became uh, a powerful warrior for the church. So who is this Ananias? We're talking today about Ananias's um, and a nice mission. So, number one, he lived in Damascus. Legend rec records that he was arrested on the orders of Governor Lucy Lucinius Mucianus and sentenced to death for being the leader of a local Christian community. It is thought that he was stoned to death outside the city. Over his tomb, a memorial was constructed and later a monastery. Secondly, he was a disciple. That means he was a worshiper of Jesus. That he was a servant, that he was a witness, that he, in other words, carried the gospel. He was, number three, a man of prayer. He heard the voice of the Lord. The Lord called to him and he responded immediately saying, yes, Lord. He was engaged in a two-way conversation with the Lord. Number four, he was a man of vision. He was in a vision when God called him. God only had to call on his name. His response was immediate. He was deep in prayer. He 
It was his, it was his spirit open to the call of God. It is interesting that the Lord spoke it is interesting that the Lord spoke to him and said to him that Saul had a vision. He was in a vision, and God said, Saul is having a vision. That's interesting to me. So why was Ananias chosen? There were other Christian people around. He was trustworthy. He was trusted by God. God knew that he would accomplish what he was called to do. What did he do? He went. God said, go, and he went. In spite of his fear of Saul of Tarsus, he said, but this guy's trying to destroy the church. In spite of that fear, he obeyed God and went to the house of Judah on Straight Street. He most likely had no idea what he would find. But he went anyway, at the risk of his own life. He was told to ask for a, a man named Saul. So this makes me think that Saul was at an inn. Saul had been led by the hand into Damascus by his companions. He couldn't see. The Lord struck him blind. The companions of Saul could have had the potential to carry out Saul's original goal. Think about that. He had a team of people going there to arrest those people. They could have had the potential to carry that out. So what did Ananias find? There was Saul, blind, most likely whimpering in prayer. Most likely crying out for forgiveness. Saul was racked with guilt. He was grieved with his guilt at what he had done to the Lord's church and therefore to the Lord. Guilt is stressful. Guilt follows you. You can't walk away from it, drive away from it, ride away from it. It follows you. It stays with you. It's hard to dismiss. You can't just dismiss guilt. Crying out for healing. He probably thought that he would never see again. He was blind. Perhaps, you know, people didn't recover from blindness in those days unless God healed them. They didn't have glasses. They didn't have optometrists or ophthalmologists or optical surgeons. They didn't even have cataract surgeons back then. So Acts chapter 9, verse 6, it says, Now get up and go into the city. Jesus has given Ananias directions. Go into the city. Or no, this is uh, where he was talking to Paul, Saul at the time. And you will be told what you must do. Ananias fought, finds that Saul is waiting Blind, stressed, unable to eat, Ananias, directed by God, comes to the rescue. Saul had been knocked to the ground. You know, there's a depiction of him falling off of a horse with a bright light. I don't know if he was on a horse. It doesn't say that. He could have been on foot with that group of people. I don't know. But there's, that's, how they painting, that's how they paint that event. But it doesn't say he was on a horse. It just says he was knocked to the ground. So he's knocked to the ground and he hasn't been able to see ever since then. This once proud man, somewhat vicious in his determination to stamp out these pesky Christians. And he's been reduced to a piteous sight. God put him that way. He hadn't had anything to eat or drink for three days. This once proud Pharisee, he thought he was doing God's work by exterminating Christians. And I mean exterminating. When they were sentenced to death, he voted against them. Now he is smitten, blind, and bewildered. He doesn't know what's going to happen next. 
He's stuck between his old life as a Pharisee and, and a new and different life that he knows nothing about. Nothing. He's between his old life and whatever's going to happen at the direction of God. And he doesn't know what's going to happen. He's, imagine him becoming what he hated. Can you imagine that? The only thing from all his studies and all of his great learning that he could depend on was the scriptures. He knew the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. God's word is forever settled in heaven. Forever settled in heaven. And Jesus said to Ananias that Saul is praying. Jesus was hearing those prayers. Ananias was also praying God spoke to him in his prayer. The vision came to him as part of the prayer that is listening. There's two parts to prayer. You, you talk to God and then you listen. Open your spirit and see if God will implant, impart something into you and if we just rattle off a bunch of needs before God and don't listen for what he has to say, then it's like having a conversation with your friend and not listen, and not having a two-way conversation. So that's rude. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't talk to somebody and then as soon as they start speaking to you, you walk away from them. But that's what we do if we close off the conversation in prayer and don't give them give a moment for God to respond and put an put a impression into your heart of what he wants you to do. As a Pharisee, Saul probably had many prayers. Now he's not saying prayers, he's praying prayers. There's a difference. Some churches, they read prayers and some they say prayers that somebody else wrote. But he's praying prayers, not He's not saying them, he's praying them. There's a difference. He's communing with God, not vocalizing re vain repetitions. And for three days he did that. No doubt he was repenting. No doubt he was seeking direction. He said, who are you, Lord, when he was knocked down? I am Jesus who you are persecuting. No doubt he was open to whatever God would lead him to. He has had a vision. A man named Ananias would come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. The vision gave him hope because he was in a hopeless condition. The touch of a believer. Annas and Ananias called him Brother Saul. Ananias went there in fear of this man. But the Lord said, he's praying. Brother Saul. This is powerful things happening here. He laid hands on him. God used the touch of a believer to bring healing. And he still does today. Saul had to wait for an agonizing three days for this powerful encounter. Saul had already been healed from the sickness of sin because he repented. The greatest healing that can happen to anyone is the healing from the sickness of sin because sin is the worst thing, with the worst illness that can happen because it has permanent, eternal consequences. Permanent. We don't know if Saul was saved on the road to Damascus or in the inn, but Ananias called him brother, indicating that Saul was born again. The message that Ananias brought, first of all, that Saul would see. He was chosen to see the righteous one. That, of course, is Jesus. He has already seen the error of his ways, but he would see Jesus. And secondly, that he would hear. He was chosen to hear words 
from his mouth. What Saul had been hearing was a message of destruction from the temple rulers. Now Saul would hear from God the message that he would share for the rest of his life. Number three, he heard that he would witness. You will be my witnesses to all people of what you have seen and heard. First, first would come the seeing and the hearing and then the telling, the sharing, the witnessing. And that's what Ananias came to bring to him. Paul's account, when he was arrested in Jerusalem and asked to speak to the crowd, this is part of what he said. This is in Acts 22, 12 to 16. A man named Ananias came to see me. This is Paul's telling of this. Came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of your ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witnesses to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. I wonder what water Saul was baptized with. There were two rivers in Damascus. In 2 Kings chapter 5, 11 to 12, it says, But Naaman went away angry and said, I, I thought that he would surely come to out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfor, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned off and went in a rage. Ananias would have baptized Saul in one of those two rivers because they were in Damascus. Was Ananias one of those that Saul was sent to arrest? Could be. He might have been one of those that was pointed out, bring him back. He was a Jewish Christian. Ananias probably would have been arrested by Saul. Imagine that. And he went and brought the message to Saul. Awesome. He was part of or even leader of the way, and as such he would have been targeted for destruction by Saul. Ananias is also listed by Hippolytus of Rome, who was born in 170 AD and died in 235 AD, and others as one of the 70 disciples whose mission is recorded in Luke chapter 10, verse one to 20. Hippolytus was a theologian in the second and third centuries. If Hippolytus is correct, Ananias was appointed as one of the 72 who would go out two by two in Luke chapter 10. After this, Luke chapter 10, verse one and two, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. It's exciting to know that a disciple of Jesus who knew him personally was sent to Damascus because Saul of Tarsus would one day go there and be converted. But wait a minute. Ananias seemed to have been a church leader in Damascus. Some say he might have been a bishop. According to Hippolytus, he knew Jesus personally. He was ready to go at the Lord's calling. The Lord used his touch to heal Saul of blindness. But wait a minute. I know Jesus personally. You know Jesus personally. Ananias might have seen and known Jesus while 
Jesus was on this earth. But we know him just as well. <laughs> we know him just as well. We can have conversations with Jesus any time or all the time. I hope I don't have to get knocked to the ground in order to hear from God. I hope that none of you has to go blind to hear from God. I hope that God doesn't have to send Ananias or an Ananias, someone like that to me or you. Instead, we need to be in the role of Ananias. Amen. <laughs> we can be an Ananias. Ananias was a hero. He faced danger. Eventually, he was murdered. We can be a hero. We may be called to face danger. A lot of missionaries are. Ananias was ready to do service for God. We can and should be ready to do service for God. We have ob obtained mercy. We can't just sit on it. We're obligated to share. So Paul to Agrippa, this is uh, King Agrippa, this is in Acts chapter 26. Then I asked, who are you? Lord. And he's explaining this to the king. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to, uh, to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He is sending us to open eyes just like he sent Ananias to restore Paul's sight. He sends us to open eyes. He sends us to turn people from darkness to the light of the gospel. He's sending us to turn people from the power of Satan to God. Ananias was a key person in the life of Paul. God used him to instruct and encourage Paul. There are a lot of people around you who need instruction and encouragement. He was listening in prayer. We need to have two-way conversations with God. It's amazing what God can tell you if you're just listening. That's part of prayer. And he was willing to go. He said, in other words, send me. Isaiah 6, chapter 8, or chapter 6, verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, Lord, send me. So are you willing? He was ready. Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. 1 Peter 3, 13 to 15, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Are, are you ready? We need to ask ourselves that question. Am I prepared? Am I being prepared? Are you preparing yourself with the word? Are you preparing yourself by listening to God? 
Ananias was prepared. He was ready. Are you preparing yourself by being filled with the Holy Spirit? Ananias was the disciple. He was the one God chose and used to minister to Saul. Saul would reach thousands in the Gentile world. He started preaching immediately. He traveled extensively, starting churches everywhere he went. He wrote 13 or 14 books of the New Testament. Ananias had a crucial role in his life. So what about you today? And I ask that of myself as well. Ananias was an unsung hero. Can you imagine what could happen if God calls you to minister to someone? I'm not saying if God calls you into the ministry. If you're a born again believer, you're already in the ministry. Amen. You're already in it. I just mean he might call you to speak to a certain person who's having, who, who is in darkness and might be in a state like Paul was in, in a crucial state where they're thinking about departing from their old ways and their old life and going into something that leads them towards God, you know? You could be the one. You could be the one. Two years ago, I was so blessed to lead nine people to the Lord. Look around this little church. Only one of those people is here. But I was so blessed to lead nine people that year to the Lord. If there's an opportunity, I'm going in. Not because I'm a minister. I led people to the Lord long before I became a minister. My first, my first convert was my sister, our sister. And we didn't get to see her in those days because she lived in a different state. I was in Connecticut, she was in Virginia or West Virginia. I got saved, called her on the phone, told her about it about a week later. I said, you want to do that? She said, yes. And I led her to the Lord on the phone after I was a new Christian and I became addicted to being a soul winner. Not because I'm a minister. That came much, much later. So I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you to do that. It's not a hard thing. Except that uh, Satan tries to derail you, tries to put obstacles in your path, and you say, get out of my way. In Jesus' name, I officially resist you. In Jesus' name, I get out of the way. <laughs> it works. I'm just here to tell you that it works. I've been in this faith since the 73rd year of the previous century. <laughs> I think he was probably in it that same year. Maybe even before that. But it works. It works. Can we gather around down here for a moment before I turn you loose? <laughs> Come on.